I'm going to go ahead and get started, everybody. Um, hello, good evening. Um, my name is Frances Craig. I'm the host of Seed Story, where we host conversations to uplift the work of other people and organizations working in agriculture, seed keeping, and activism, um, and working to build solidarity around issues affecting food growers and seed keepers. Um, I have my coworker Renee on with me, offering tech support. Thank you, Chica. Um, and I'm so honored to be in virtual circle tonight with all of you and Sherry Manning with Global Seed Savers. Um, Sherry Manning is the founder and the executive director. Um, Sherry, thank you so much for taking time to be with us this evening. Um, I'm really excited to dig into the conversation and learn more about your recent experiences and your organization's programs. So uh, go ahead and jump in, Sherry. All right. Um, well, thanks everybody. It's nice to be here and thanks to Seeds in Common for having me. Um, and great that we have folks calling in from all around the world. A few of my colleagues in the Philippines were, were going to join us, but they are not able to anymore. So I'm gonna hold down the fort for us. Um, I did just wanna uh, start off by doing something that's super important to us at Global Seed Savers. And I know it's equally important to, to, to our partners at Seeds in Common, um, but I'm calling in from Denver, Colorado tonight. I'm in my home office, which is on the traditional lands of the Cheyenne and Arapaho people. And there's actually 48 other indigenous peoples that call Colorado home. Um, and, and for our work in seed saving, for our work um, around the world, it's super important to root ourselves in land and in the peoples on these lands. Um, and in addition, at Global Seed Savers, um, our work is primarily focused in the Philippines. Um, and we're very, very fortunate to work with um, many of the 110 ethno-linguistic indigenous peoples groups of the Philippines, as well as non-indigenous peoples. And, and for us, you know, we really believe and see through our, our partnerships that seeds are an essential piece of indigenous peoples continued struggle to ensure uh, a regenerative and, and long lasting food system um, for all of us. And so for us at Global Seed Savers, it's really important to root in those belief systems and to honor those communities that we get to work with. And we're really fortunate to learn from every day in the work that we do. Um, I am going to share my screen um, because I have a few slides, mainly pictures that I want to share that hopefully um, will help give you an idea of kind of what's going on with our work in the Philippines. And it's always just nice to get to see the faces of our farmers um, and get to do my best to, to represent them. Um, let's see here. So again, you know, really rooting in our, our origins. Uh, maybe some of you are asking, Sherry, you don't look Filipino. Why are you working in the Philippines? Uh, very fair question to ask. And, you know, my origins in this work began um, 17 years ago when I first went to the Philippines as a Peace Corps volunteer. Um, so that was back when the Peace Corps didn't, um, you didn't really get to pick where you go. So I was fresh out of undergrad, wanting to experience the world, learn from the world, spend some time in a new and, and different place. And I always like to say that the Philippines chose me um, because it has been an incredibly transformational experience to get to work in the Philippines now since 2006 and learn from um, the amazing Filipino partners and communities and families that I've had the fortunate um, nature to get to get to know and, and become acquainted with. And, and really all of that is rooted in my host family. So when I was first in the Philippines from 2006 to 2008 as a Peace Corps volunteer, I lived with the lovely Kosalan family that's pictured here. Um, and this is the matriarch of the family, Lola Carmen. Um, she is 80, 90, excuse me, 95 years old. I just actually got to visit with her last uh, fall when I was back in the Philippines. And it's really their ancestral land right battle and their story of wanting to be an education space for the next generation in the Philippines that has inspired what's now Global Seed Savers. Um, and our work is really rooted in the land and in relationship and in peoples. And so for me, while our work has grown exponentially, we are a much more sophisticated and organized and growing organization. For me, um, my work is always going to be centered in, in the wonderful relationships that I began to build um, 17 years ago when I first went to the Philippines. Um, I'll just give a little bit of an overview of um, our model and who we are and the work that we do. I know that Francis has some questions maybe too, but maybe I'll just run through 
my slides first and then we can go to questions. Um, so again, what started with my host family during my Peace Corps service and their really incredible land right battle um, to be restored their indigenous land right of their land and then wanting to reopen their farm to the public to be an education space and a training center um, is really what began our organization. But now Global Seed Savers has grown into a much more robust international development organization. Um, so at Global Seed Savers, we really root ourselves in the principles of food and seed sovereignty. And for us, that means helping restore communities' connection to their own practices of how to best restore and grow regenerative food systems. Um, and so we enter communities via an education program. Um, we teach a curriculum called Seed School. I know that Seeds in Common has history with that same program. We've adapted it over the years to the local context and really try to make it applicable to the Philippine partners that we work with. But we bring technical training and education to communities. And you know, maybe some of you are asking or people have asked this in the past, well, aren't Filipino farmers saving seeds? Aren't, aren't the communities that you work with already doing this? And, and the answer is some are, um, but the reality is in the last 30 to 40 years, our agriculture system around the globe and the Philippines is no different, has really become dependent on hybrid and chemically treated seeds. And so while most of our partners have the, the, the knowledge of seed saving in their lineage, many of our partners um, have moved away from that tradition and have grown incredibly dependent on buying seeds from what we like to call chemical supply stores, but from what are typically called farm supply stores. And so something that we take a lot of pride in in our model is we meet communities where they're at, bringing this technical training and knowledge, but also acknowledging that they have this knowledge and sometimes they just need that partner to help them re-engage with that process and envision it under the new terms that are happening right now. Um, so we, we teach seed school and then we help communities conduct seed trials. Um, and so it's, it's really wonderful to see our farmers who actually most of our farmers are organic practitioners, but prior to us coming in, they were still growing hybrid or chemically treated seeds. And what we've been able to help them realize is they can produce their own open pollinated seeds. Um, and so they're really going back to that practice. Um, and then we help communities establish seed libraries. And then we also continue that cycle of ongoing farmer education and training programs. And I'll get into a little bit more of some of our program specifics as well. Um, so in the last, uh, since 2015, we've trained over 5,000 farmers and participants across the Philippines in the historical practice of saving seeds. Um, we currently either manage directly or co-manage six seed libraries in the, in the country. And um, our seed production sites and our seed libraries have, um, this number is a little bit off, but around 200 varieties of seeds currently. And so, you know, we really believe that a regenerative and vibrant food system is rooted in the diversity of the crops that are being produced. So we're, we're also working side by side with our partner farmers, ensuring that they're able to grow a wide variety of crops. Um, and I'll just share an example. One of our partner farmers, Pastor Andrew, he has 200 square meters of land. Um, and so in a Western context, most people would call him a backyard gardener. In the Philippines, that's considered a farmer. Um, and he has over 30 different varieties of seeds being produced. And he's one of our most prolific seed producers because he's created a whole ecosystem on his land, which is really, really phenomenal to see. So these are just some of our impacts and stats um, from 2022. Um, it's been really amazing to see what, what was rooted in my Peace Corps community in the north of the country in Tublai, Benguet, grow um, exponentially over these last years. So just last year in 2022, we were able to, to conduct seed school trainings and, and form partnerships in all these different regions of the Philippines. If you're not familiar, the Philippines is over 7,000 islands. Um, it's a very diverse nation. Um, so there's, there's large, um, both environmental, cultural, language differences, just a few hours away from the different locations throughout the landlocked areas, as well as on the islands. And so it's, it's all of our work is made possible through partnerships and through organizations and communities reaching out and saying, hey, we want you to bring your expertise and we will, we will help embed that in the community development and the programming that we're already doing. Um, but I can't emphasize enough that the Philippines is an incredibly rich and diverse 
uh, country. And so it really, this work takes a lot of adaptation, not only in the seeds that are being produced and the different, um, you know, bioregions, but also in, in learning to navigate and work with the various different um, cultural communities and realities in the country. Uh, this is one of our seed libraries um, in at our in Cebu, which is one of the southern islands. Actually, shout out to Renee. Renee's mom is Cebuana, and Renee has roots in Cebu. Cebu's down here. Um, so we operate a 1,200 square meter seed production farm in Cebu, as well as have a seed library there. So this is a picture of my recent trip last fall. Um, with some of the seeds um, at the seed production site, as well as our seed library of our partner NGO. Um, and for us, this, this moving into uh, more expanded seed production is an essential piece of our model. There is an incredible demand for open pollinated high quality seed throughout the Philippines, but there is not enough of it. And so we really see our role as, as bringing that education and that technical training and that, that skill set of how to go back to saving seeds to farmers. And then also when we're able, investing in supporting either our own seed production site where we can grow more seed um, or encouraging our partner communities to do that. Um, so right now we operate this 1200 square meter seed production site in Cebu. And that is becoming a really important piece of what I'm going to get into in a little bit of the climate realities in the Philippines. Um, the Philippines is actually one of the most climate vulnerable nations in the world. And so the real live time data each month, each quarter, each year of what seeds are being produced well, what seeds are surviving the storms, what seeds aren't at our seed production sites are really going to be the food that feeds the next communities in the Philippines as they continue to face typhoons throughout um, the realities of climate change. <clears throat> um, another big part of our model is our seed school teacher training program. And so this is where we help uh, guide our farmers through a, a program of learning to teach seed school to their peers, um, which is really, really exciting. You know, we're getting more and more requests to bring our seed school program throughout the country, but we're still a very small and mighty team. And so we really want to equip our farmers to be the teachers in their own communities. And so this is actually a picture of a seed school teacher training that we launched last year. It was a three day program. All of these partner farmers learned to facilitate seed school. And then immediately after that training, they were able to go and teach 75 participants seed school. Um, so they immediately had a real time opportunity to share that knowledge and wisdom, which is wonderful. So kind of a nod to, to what I shared about the climate realities in the Philippines. Um, maybe you all learned about this or read about it in the news. Um, at the end of 2021, one of the largest storms on record hit the Philippines uh, the week prior to Christmas, uh, Typhoon Odette. Um, there was $1.8 billion of damages uh, throughout the Philippine islands. Um, about 9 million people were displaced um, in the coming months post the typhoon. And all of our partner farmers in Cebu were impacted. Um, and we are not a relief organization. We don't provide um, you know, relief goods or immediate relief to communities. We really see ourselves as a long-term partner. Um, but we were actually the first responders for our 28 core seed savers in Cebu. Um, and we have now launched a program with all of them, not only initially getting them um, the potable water, the solar lights, the initial things that they need, but now helping them plan and prepare for the next typhoon and ensure that they're rebuilding their farms that were destroyed in regenerative ways. And so we've launched a program called IDOFS with a local partner consultant in the Philippines. IDOFS stands for Integrated Diversified Organic Farming Systems. Um, and this is a, a way to really root regenerative agriculture principles um, into our 28 partner farmers that were impacted by the typhoon and help them not just focus on the seed component, but really think about the whole ecosystem of their farm as they're rebuilding their farms and preparing for their future. Because the reality um, that the Philippines already knows and that we're only just starting to see um, in this part of the world is it's not a matter of if the next typhoon comes, it's a matter of when. And, and what our farmers are seeing is that the typhoons are getting, um, they're more frequent 
and they're of more intensity. And so for us at Global Seed Savers, really ensuring that we're, we're preparing seed stock, that we're working with our farmers to make sure that they have backup seed in those typhoon situations, but that they're also planning their farms to be um, more resilient in, in, in the realities that the typhoons bring. <clears throat> and then, as I mentioned, we have our seed production site. Um, so this last year, we were able to, to develop five more garden beds on that site. Um, 13 new varieties of seeds were produced, and we are um, very slowly starting to do some seed sales, although that's not the emphasis of our work. Again, we really want to equip our partners and communities to just have the seed stock and to be growing more quality seed. Um, but again, there is a demand on the market for seed. And so we were able to help facilitate around 900 US dollars in sales of seed for our farmers. And just to give you an economic kind of lens on that, most of our farmers live on around um, $1,000 a year um, and, and access to local seed. So their ability to produce their own seed, we've found is saving them around 10% of their income. Um, so that's around $100 annually, um, which is a tremendous savings. I think we'd all like to save $100 if we could each month or annually. <clears throat> And then I'm gonna pause there. That's kind of big picture. Uh, Global Seed Savers, our programming, how we do our work. I know that, that Francis has some questions around some of the recent opportunities that we've had. So I might pause and see if you wanna jump in with questions. But again, it's really great to be here. Always an honor to get to share about our work. Um, and I would say that just a, a thought before I let you jump in, Francis, like this work has never been more important. Um, I think that's why we're all on this call. I think that's why we're all connected to an organization like Seeds in Common. And I think what's exciting for me, being the founder of this organization and seeing where we're at in our life cycle right now, it's really exciting to see that more and more people are waking up to that and that more and more people are getting engaged in our work. And in particular, that our partnered farmers are becoming leaders in being the strongest advocates for this work in their own communities. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing all of that, Sherry. And congratulations on creating this organization and all of the successes and all of the impact that you've been able to make. It's just really amazing work. So congratulations and thank you so much for sharing. I have so many questions <laughs> um, based off of what you just shared. And so I definitely want to dig a bit more into, you know, the specific seed saving programs that you um, that you mentioned, and so when you say you um, you know you partner and you offer support, like what does the support look like? Is it financial support? Is it material support? Are you organizing with manpower? Um, like what does it look like actually on the land in the Philippines? Yeah, no, that's a that's a great question. Um, we really believe in collaboration and in meeting our partners. You know side by side where they're at. So um, I would say it, it looks different in every community depending on their needs. Um, we really also believe that that everyone has agency and an ability to engage in these in these processes. And so as much as possible, there's always a counterpart of our community. So even when we bring a seed school to a partner, um, we're not fully funding that ourselves. Um, there's, there's a way for the community to provide either in kind or in participant fees, their ability to participate in those trainings. Um, so yes, we do offer financial support in particular as we're getting things off the ground. Um, we've implemented a model during COVID where we were doing seed library kits on farm for our partner farmers because we were not able to gather in person anymore like we normally did. And so we were able to distribute kind of smaller on farm seed library kits so all of our farmers could still engage throughout the pandemic in having the right materials to properly store and save their seeds. So I would say, yes, we offer financial support, but we also offer technical training knowledge and support. Um, and then we, we do offer community development and community building support as needed. Our founding farmers group in Binget, the Binget Association of Seed Savers, um, we um, have really helped them form their organization and, and embed kind of how they want to operate. Um, again, really us being a facilitator of that process. So allowing the farmer's voices to be uplifted and how they want to run their organization, but us kind of helping facilitate that conversation. I think I saw a question 
uh, pop in the chat. Yeah, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. We have a board here in the US and then we also have a Philippine board because we are actually two entities. Um, we're a US entity and then we're an equivalent um, entity in the Philippines. And we really believe, again, that good development and the guidance and the strategy and the know-how of how to do this is in the hands of the people there. And so it's very important to us that we have a Philippine board of directors and our Philippine staff get to help guide the vision and mission of the organization as well. So yes, we do have a board. We have two boards, a US board and a Philippine board. Awesome. Um, how many people do you have on staff in the Philippines? Yeah, yeah, we are actually going through some staff transitions right now, um, but we we have uh, three full time staff in the Philippines. Um, we have a program manager who was going to join us tonight, but wasn't able to. Uh, we have our seed production coordinator in Cebu, Harry, and then we have a marketing communications and development position in the Philippines as well, Sarah. And then one of our partner farmers, Manang Elizabeth, um, is kind of a part time position um, doing field coordination in the northern part of the country. So we have three full-time staff. We'll be hiring a fourth because um, we're searching for our next Philippine executive director currently. Awesome, that's a lean and mean team, but it sounds like, you know, through your collaborative forces and your relationships that like the team definitely goes beyond just those three, soon four individuals. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I wanted to give you some more space to dive into um, specifically how your seed saving programs build climate resilient communities and networks. So when we were emailing earlier this week, you kind of broke it down into three different programs, the seed school teacher training model, the integrated diversified organic farming program, and then the growing network of seed teachers. So I was just wondering if there was some more details that you wanted to share on that topic. Yeah, yeah, I, I feel like I, I shared quite a bit. Um, maybe I'll okay. just share a story um, and uh, kind of in the spirit of of of, of for a mentor, um, you know, it's in our stories that we learn, and often it's when things are being the most challenged when we learn the most. And so, a real test of our very first seed library that we established back in 2017 in Tublai Benguet was a typhoon came through there in 2018. Um, and it actually, you know, just like the typhoon Odette two years ago in Cebu, that typhoon um, impacted all of our farmers in the north. But what we learned from that is our seed library remained intact. The seed library was in a secure enough a central location that it remained intact. And so literally just days after that typhoon, all of our partner farmers were able to go and access their seeds, seeds that they had produced, seeds that they knew would be resilient and seeds that they could plant immediately, as opposed to having to wait for the external um, aid and things that were coming in. And so for us, that was a really prime example of this is why community-based seed libraries are so important, right? And we've only seen that time and time again. After all the typhoons since then, the first request that is made of us and our farmers ask for, or they peers and other organizations ask for is seeds. Um, and so we really believe the model of helping equip communities to produce their own seed and helping them establish a shared network of how to share that resource and ensure that that resource is not only serving them now, but can be stored away to serve them in the future is an essential piece of climate resiliency. In fact, it's the only way that communities are gonna be able to feed themselves as typhoons continue to hammer the islands. Um, I think another important piece about our work is all of our farmers um, currently are, many of them are market farmers. So a lot of them are producing seeds that actually aren't, are producing crops that aren't actually native to the Philippines. Um, the Philippines has gone through many, many years of colonization. Um, and with that, you know, different foods have come in for right or wrong, that's the case. And a lot of the high market value crops are not actually vegetables that are historically growing in the Filipino climate. And so seed saving for those seeds can be quite a challenge. So that's something that we're actually helping teach our farmers is how to properly save cabbage or carrot seeds, because um, those actually don't save as well as some other varieties. But the exciting thing that we've seen as farmers are getting more engaged in this practice and going back to this knowledge that all of their ancestors have is that they want to go back to growing wild crops. They want to go back to growing a lot of their indigenous food systems. And so we're really wanting to help uplift and support those projects as well, in addition to growing the, the seeds that are on most demand in the market. 
Um, and so that's a really exciting piece, I think, of, of this climate resiliency with the food system is we have to start to think about the need to eat different foods as well as go back to the crops that are being, you know, that are most um, resilient in the, in the realities of the current time. Amazing. That's a perfect segue into my next question. I was curious when you were giving your slides about um, producing 13 new seed varieties. I was curious what kind of seeds you guys are interested you guys are producing and how does it differ from somebody that's in the states doing, you know, backyard gardening or the typical, you know, market farming model that we see here. Yeah, no, um, great question. So again, the Philippines is an incredibly biodiverse uh, country. And so depending on the region, you know, different seeds are produced at the seed production site in Cebu currently. Um, it's a lot of the lower land um, kind of hotter, better in hot weather vegetables. So we've had very, we've had great success with okra. Um, we've, we've had pretty tremendous success with beans in all of our locations, different varieties of legumes. Um, and then I think one of the other big crops um, in the south at the seed production site is um, there's a, a Filipino crop called umpalaya. It's bitter gourd. Um, so we've had success with that. Um, so it's a, it's a lot of the lower land um, popular vegetables in that bioregion of the Philippines. So certainly very different than what you see um, here in, in the very short growing season that I have here in my home state of Colorado. Very cool, thank you. And you were just speaking to the desire of the farmers wanting to have more wild crops grown and getting more back to an indigenous food system. So what, um, what does that look like? What crops does that include? Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a work in progress. A lot of that. One of our partner farmers, um, Macario, I actually have a picture of him somewhere I could show, but he, he actually runs a really beautiful kind of food forest. And so a lot of those crops include uh, different wild plants, wild shrubs, um, as well as I think there's so many different varieties of legumes, right, that, that, that are in the Philippines. What you see in the market is often in the north, they call it Baguio beans, but it's like green beans. But our farmers actually have the capability and know that there's tons of different varieties of beans. And so again, I think it's 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 just re-diversifying a lot of the crops that are being produced. And then again, a lot of our farmers do produce lettuce, um, other you know, kind of higher value crops, but I think the, the wild crops play a particularly important role um, and in the Philippines, we don't actually help our farmers with these crops, but there's tubers everywhere, right? Um, and so that's a different saving process, but there's, there's gabi, there's, um, there's all sorts of different tubers where you either eat the actual root or in the Philippines, they're actually eating the leaves of those crops as well. And my kind of entry um, into this work when I was a Peace Corps volunteer was I actually helped my host family. Um, there's a wild fern in the Philippines called Paco. Um, that historically grows along riverbanks. Uh, our, our founding farm, my host family's farm, um, has a river running through it, but it was actually quite contaminated from an upstream mine. Um, and so Paco was kind of being impacted by growing wildly on the, on the riverbed. So we actually brought it up and put it into the terraces. And so we're producing fern in that way. And that's an edible fern. So that's kind of my like entry, entry crop into the Philippines and a, and a wild crop that's very common in the Philippines that people know is, it's kind of like a fiddlehead fern. Ah, that's fascinating. And do you, do you eat it when it's in kind of the uncurling like fiddle phase? Yep. Yeah, you, oh. you, you harvest it at that young stage. It makes a really lovely salad or a, like a quick saute with garlic. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> So I'm curious, you were just talking about the tubers um, being really abundant in the Philippines. So I'm wondering, like, would you consider tubers as being like a local staple food for Filipinos? Or what do you notice as being staple foods in the area? Like I'm thinking in the U.S. we have corn, wheat, soy, um, but most people that are growing backyard gardens or market farming do the annuals of the carrots and the lettuce and the things like that. So how do you see those two things happening in the Philippines? Yeah, no, it's a great question. So the Philippines is a rice eating and rice producing country. Um, although I won't get into all of the geopolitics around rice. I'm not an expert, but I certainly can provide some perspective. Um, you know, 
rice is a very important essential crop in much of the Philippines, but because of various uh, multilateral agreements with many countries, rice farming continues to be quite a challenge for a lot of rice producers, um, just because of the the emphasis on importing rice from neighboring countries at a cheaper cost. So that's getting into some of the bigger geopolitics of this these efforts. Um, but rice is a staple um, in the north. Um, uh, the, many of the indigenous peoples that we work with in the north, camote, which is a, a, a sweet potato, is a staple crop. Um, and as well as there is a native corn in the southern part of Cebu, a variety of corn that some of our farmers work with there. Um, Again, the Philippines having many, many years of colonization, a lot of those crops actually were brought in by the Spaniards, um, but have been kind of reclaimed as local crops um, and have been now in a lot of those communities food paths for a number of years um, for multiple generations. And so while they may not be, not all of those are native to the Philippines, they, they really consider them staple crops um, for their diet. And then there's also um, a really interesting millet um, in one of our partner communities in Cebu. It's called kabog. Um, it's actually part of the slow food arc of taste movement. And that's a, a native millet. Um, so a, a grain staple um, in that region of Cebu. Very cool. Thank you. Um, Johannes asked a question earlier, and I think it ties in to where we are in the conversation now. Um, he was wondering, like, how self-sufficient is the Philippines on food? You know, how much control or agency do they have over their food supply? Yeah, that's a very big question. Um, yeah. How much agency or control do any of us have over our food supply, right? Um, so I guess I'll, I'll answer it in, in a few ways. Um, I think the, the pandemic highlighted the extreme challenges in uh, the food supply network in the Philippines. And that really what we observed and what we were able to help tackle with partners was it was actually our the urban communities that were experiencing the most food insecurity in the early days of the pandemic. Um, because we've told our, we've worked with our partner farmers for years telling them, you all have incredible wealth. You are producing your country's food, right? Um, and so when the pandemic happened and supply chains were cut down and there was no movement, um, what we saw was a lot of our farmers in the north, which is one of the vegetable baskets of the country, there was a lot of food waste. There was crops going to waste because the supply chains of getting that food down to the big, densely populated metropolitan areas had stopped. Um, but those communities still needed food. The urban environment still needed food. And so we actually set up a program. Um, our, our past executive director really envisioned this with our partners um, called Iduyan, um, which is a, an Ibaloi term um, for coming together or mutual aid. There's, there's lots of terms like that in different Filipino languages, but we chose the, the community and the language that we work in in the North. And so we were able to partner with other NGOs in Metro Manila who were working with uh, primarily urban, urban poor communities, folks that were really food insecure to, to bring our crops from the North down to Metro Manila and ensure that they had access to healthy organic food. And then the neat thing with that too is our farmers didn't lose out on their economic opportunity to be paid for the crops that they were producing and that food wasn't going to waste. Um, and so that actually turned into quite a robust program. Um, I think we were able to distribute over 300,000 pounds of food during that program. Um, and it also kept people employed during those initial months of the pandemic that were quite challenging for everyone. So I really believe that most places have the ability to be more food secure. It's a matter of how we do that and how we look at it. Um, and so the Philippines is, is an agricultural country, right? Um, everyone, most people, there's food being grown. It's just a matter of distribution and the quality of food and how it gets to those that need it most. Um, so I would say that the pandemic, again, presented let our farmers recognize, hey, we're actually quite secure. We're, we have backyard gardens, we grow our food. It's those in the densely populated urban areas. That's where a lot of the food insecurity challenges are. I'm not saying there aren't in other areas because there are, but I think what we've seen is this reawakening to why local food systems are so important and not being so dependent on making sure that the food that you eat in Manila comes from the communities seven hours away in the north, but that communities really need to be thinking about their own food security within their own community. 
Mm. Yes, preach, sister. That's that was an amazing response. Thank you for that. Um, so I'm just like in my mind visualizing like what these smaller farm farms look like in the Philippines. And so I'm curious, like water, you know, are they setting up, you know, poly tubing with drip lines? Are they holding water? Are they collecting fog? What are their methods of having, you know, water freedom on their farms? Yeah, great question. Um, unlike well, your location there, or even where I'm at here in Colorado, um, the Philippines um, either has dry season or typhoon season, right? And so there's either a lack of water or an overabundance of water, right? Um, I would say most of our farmers have some sort of, not super advanced, but some sort of irrigation system, um, be that just their own you know, PVC piping with little drips put in. Um, many of our farmers do engage in water catchment when needed. Um, I think the bigger challenge that, that we don't have an answer to, but that we're wanting to work with our partners and other experts to help find is, is really the challenges that the extreme weather brings when there's too much water, right? How do you preserve crops when they're just being hammered by typhoons. And in, in, in our experience, those crops actually don't get preserved. Or if they do, that's the crop that you want to save, right? If, if a typhoon comes in and everything is wiped out, but that one row of beans survives, that's your, that's your survivor. That's the one that you want to save and keep replanting because that's the one that's starting to adapt to that environment. Um, so most of our farmers um, don't currently implement a lot of what we would maybe call like sophisticated technologies, but are certainly utilizing um, some drip systems, some water catchment systems, things like that. Very cool. Thank you. Um, there was a gentleman who is farming in Ecuador who, um, who emailed us at Seeds in Common for, um, for scholarship for our Seed School 101 program. And, um, and we've been kind of emailing back and forth and he's on a small um, one acre plot with him and his sister and his aunt and they're right at the foothills of some mountains there and so they have built a fog catching machine and it's not even really a machine it's essentially four walls um, and the 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 four corners are like pvc piping maybe 12 feet tall each wall would be four or six feet wide and it's like mesh and so the water will collect on the mesh and the mesh is like pretty tightly woven and so when the water collects, it, it, it collects in the mesh and then it will drip down and they harvest the water and it drips down like a, um, like a half moon PVC pipe into a holding uh, tank that they, um, they have it going like downhill with uh, old swimming pools, like kiddie pools. And so here in the US, I'm not sure we would call that sophisticated, but to me, I'm like, that's sophisticated. That yeah. is very sophisticated technology. Yep. Um, and he made a point to to speak to how most of the materials that they use to create the fog catchment system were repurposed, locally found materials, essentially that would be wasted. And I'm like, that is that's innovative, that's sophisticated, yep. as good as anything else that I've ever heard called those things. Um, absolutely, absolutely, yep. Do you um, does the Philippines have any regulations with catching rainwater? I know there's some weird, like depending on where you are in Colorado, and I think also in New Mexico, um, there's regulations with catching water and holding water on your property. Not that I'm aware of, um, but that's a that's an interesting question. I should do some follow up on that. But yeah, most of our farmers are, you know, um, catching water in some in some way, um, especially during the times where there's an abundance of it. Um, but not that I'm aware of. And another thing that we're really engaged with, we we collaborate with the Philippine Permaculture Association and many of our farmers have attended permaculture design courses and really bring in a lot of that, you know, whole ecosystem design principles into their, their farming practices. And, and that's some of what we've tried to help um, in our training opportunities is farmers really recognizing, you know, the need to think just not just the plots that they're putting the produce in, but the whole ecosystem and really thinking about how to build those zones and have those different swales and the different catchment areas and all of those important pieces. So. Very cool. So when you guys are hosting the trainings or, um, you know, coming together to brainstorm solutions, 
um, you know, like where is the knowledge coming from? Like, is the community coming together to brainstorm? Do you have like masters or experts like identified that are familiar with the climate that comes in or like, what does that look like? Yeah, so all of our trainings, um, farmers are teachers in them. And so we really believe that our farmers have knowledge and wisdom to share. And so they are participants and trainers of the next seed schools. Um, so the farmers are teaching their peers, um, as well as some of our staff, I would say, have technical expertise. Um, that's actually something that we want to build up more in our team as we're growing. Um, and then as I shared, we will bring on consultants as needed to, to lead and guide particular programs. So an example is the IDOFS program that we brought in last year in response to Typhoon Odette. That's working with a, an, a Filipino consultant that's coming in to teach those regenerative and IDOFS uh, farming principles. Um, but we really believe at Global Seed Savers that our farmers have the tremendous knowledge and wisdom um, to teach their peers and try our best to facilitate opportunities for them to be the ones up front teaching those programs, in addition to our local staff. Yes, thank you. Um, Johannes had another question. Um, you mentioned dry season and typhoon season. How are the growing seasons compared? How are the growing season compared to the weather seasons? So perhaps the question is, um, what time of year is it typhoon season and what time of year is the dry season? Yeah, so it's changing, right? Uh, typhoon season is coming sooner um, mm -hmm. is what we're seeing. Um, but right now is is the dry planting season, although it's a tropical climate, so things are planted year round. Uh, but the, the 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 heavy typhoon seasons, it's it's starting to shift. Um, when I first went to the Philippines, it was really um, it was really I think in June moving into the our fall seasons here. But we're we're now starting to see that extend. And actually, the last two years, the largest storms have been in December, um, which is quite late. Um, that Typhoon Odette that hit in, in 2021, the week before Christmas, was the week before Christmas, I think it was December 16th. Um, that, that, that was quite late to have such a strong and impactful storm. Um, so the, the seasons are shifting, but people do plant year round in the tropical climate, um, just trying to, to be aware of the typhoons and the storms that, that may or may not be coming. Uh, yeah, thank you. I, I did have, have that question too, so thanks for answering. Um, I want to ask you about GB9, but before we kind of move into that, I'm wondering if there's anything that you wanted to add about your seed saving programs or the seed libraries that you manage. Yeah, I mean, I think just one thing I always like to say, and I think I've kind of emphasized this, but I just want to say it again, because I know this is a friendly crowd and maybe new people listening. You know, we take a lot of, of pride in being an organization that isn't saying that we're doing something really innovative and new, right? We really believe that seed saving and these practices are a long standing tradition that we're helping communities go back to something that's in all of our lineage. And yes, we need to adapt. We need to operate in the present time that we're living in, but we really believe that the best way to do that is to go back to this historical wisdom and maybe do it in a new and innovative reality of, of now, but really rooting ourselves in that this doing something as basic as learning to save your own seeds and grow food for your community is innovative in and of itself. Um, so I just always like to emphasize that because I think it's easy in the sector that we're in, in the nonprofit sector, um, to want to do the next splashy big thing, which isn't necessarily bad. There's a need for technology. There's a need for new innovations. But we really believe that seed saving is a, a longstanding innovation in and of itself. Yeah, thank you again for highlighting that. It's definitely a, a delicate dance between like meeting the modern needs and honoring that ancestral land-based wisdom. Um, so let's jump into GB9. What is the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture? It's like, <laughs> I ha have to do like three Google sessions just to get the name right. <laughs> yeah, I know. You did a great job. When I was leading up to attending it, um, I would like rattle it off to friends and they're like, what? Like a whatchamacallit? So um, yes, so we had the good fortune um, through our mentor and the founder of Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance, Bill McDorman, um, this last fall to participate as an NGO observer at the ninth governing body session 
of the Food and Agriculture Organization's ITPGRFA, which is the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture. So this is the treaty that governs 63 of the world's most common crops. Um, you can go, I think Francis is putting in the, in the chat, you can go and see what those crops are. Many of them are what you would think, some of the most common grains, most common vegetables, things like that. And so the treaty governs um, really all the players that are a part of producing that genetic material. Um, this was a huge opportunity for us. Bill was able to attend and represent um, with past RMSA staff um, in 2019 at the treaty conference in Rome. Um, and then this last year, it was held in New Delhi, India. And so myself, um, our, our former executive director in the Philippines, Karen, and Bill McDormand all attended. Um, and it was a big eye-opening experience for us. Um, it was really amazing to see um, that the world even attempts to come together and agree on anything, let alone um, the crops that are feeding the world. Um, so it was really fascinating to get to witness um, the bigger geopolitics that are playing out for a treaty that governs these crops. Um, you know, every about not every, but I think it's 52 countries, I'm, don't quote me on the number, um, have signed the treaty. And so countries from all over the world are represented. And so they have voting delegates. Um, and then there's, you can participate as an observer. And so that's how we were there was as an NGO observer. And I would say I learned the most from actually engaging and interacting with our fellow NGO colleagues. Every morning before the sessions, we would gather and meet. Um, there are people in those rooms who have been a part of founding the treaty. In fact, a, a good friend of Bill's and now a friend of ours, Andrew Mishida, who runs a really delicate and um, not delicate, but a really wonderful organization in Zimbabwe. Um, he was a part of the founding of the treaty. Um, and, and, and so it was really amazing to gather every morning we would get our ducks in the row about what was being discussed and the stance that we wanted to take as collective NGOs. And so then the way it works on the floor is the different country delegates and, and voting delegates get to speak on the matter. And then once everyone has spoken, um, they open it up for observers to get to speak. And so each morning, depending on the subject, we would elect someone from our network to read a statement on behalf of the NGOs and the CSOs, the community supported organizations, about our opinion on the matters that were happening. Um, one of the big debates at this year's um, was farmers' rights. Article nine of the treaty does recognize farmers' rights, um, but there has been a six year working group to figure out what does that mean and how is that really implemented? And what does that language need to look like in the treaty? As you can imagine, uh, many of the bigger Western powers that be had some qualms with particular language um, in honoring and recognizing farmers' rights. And so uh, this was actually a tremendous honor. Karen, uh, my former colleague, she got to read the farmers' rights statement on behalf of all the um, NGOs on the floor of the main treaty. Um, and I can actually share the link to that video if you wanted to post it, because um, it was just a really wonderful opportunity to get to, to name our stance and to make sure that that everyone in the in the hall knew that you know, all of us as NGOs represent the billions of farmers around the world who are the ones preserving our genetic material, and they need to be at the forefront of the decisions in how the treaty and these bigger multilateral institutions are funding and supporting this work. So um, I would say we really gained the most and learned the most from engaging with the other NGO colleagues. Um, people in that room have learned how to navigate that whole system. Um, we really, those that know that really get to be lobbyists, um, you know, as different matters were coming forward for votes, um, the countries that were supportive of the NGOs would, would find those networks and make sure that they voted correctly. Um, so it was really a, a fascinating experience. And I think one thing it did for us and, and for me is really helped us recognize that yes, our work is focused in the Philippines, but we're a part of this much larger ecosystem. And being a player in the room at these global scales is so essential. If the NGO networks and the farmers' rights organizations weren't there, the discussions, how things ended up, would have gone a completely different way. And so it was really powerful to get to see how 
having us in the room, having farmers get to share their stories on the stage did impact the bigger decisions that were made um, at, the, at the higher treaty level. Um, so it was, it was a phenomenal experience. I could talk more, a lot more about it. Um, it's fascinating to know how those systems and processes work. Um, building policy, building treaties takes a long time. You gotta be patient. It's a lot of wordsmithing, um, but it matters at the end of the day. It's a huge institution that has a lot of funding um, that can continue to do a lot of good in the world if it's done well and in collaboration with all the right partners. Yeah, that is absolutely fascinating. So thank you for grounding us in that whole system because even just trying to go online and read about it, I'm like, okay, but what is what do they actually do? What is actually going on? So these players all come together, these people that are representing their, you know, NGOs or CSOs or, you know, larger government organizations all come together to discuss farmers' rights and patent laws and uh um, genetic material and all of these things and then whatever comes forth whatever ideas or topics um, are agreed upon then you know there's actionable steps that are steps that are created to be taken to move that into a policy or to move that into um, something actionable so that it is affecting change in the world is that a pretty good yeah yeah and I will say too the um Various um, <laughs> larger gen gene banks are a part of that whole system too. Okay. So there's government representation, there's voting delegates from the signatory countries, there was the NGO networks, and then there's all, there's the seed industry, there's the mm -hmm. seed banks, you know, um, and so it's all the players. I mean, Bill, any of you that know Bill on the call, you'll appreciate this. He, the first day on the floor, and he'd been to it in Rome, so he knew, he looked at us and he said, isn't this exciting? everyone here is talking about seeds. And he's right. Everyone there was talking about seeds. It was from different vantage points. It was from different perspectives, but everyone there was talking about genetic material and these 64 different crops that the treaty manages. And so that, that was, you know, that was a cool way that Bill always has to like bring us down to the core of it, you know? Um, I will say one actionable thing that came out of the treaty that we're really looking forward to participating in this year is um, the farmer's rights resolution did pass. Um, the language was not as strong as we in the NGO network had wanted it to be, but it did pass. And a, a next step from that is the, the Indian government offered to host again, a farmer's rights symposium. Um, and it sounds like that's going to happen in September back in New Delhi. And what that's going to do is bring together all the players from the voting delegates, from the NGOs, from other people involved in the treaty that want to come together and discuss farmers' rights and how you implement them and learn from each other about how the different countries around the world are implementing farmers' rights systems and engaging in that work together. And so we're really looking forward to hopefully attending that bringing many of our farmers, if we're able, and then also returning to Navdanya, uh, where we got to spend uh, three days post the treaty, and we actually got to meet Dr. Vandana Shiva. But we're looking forward to um, continuing to engage with the FAO and the treaty in that capacity, as well as hopefully uh, be able to bring our farmers to that Farmers' Rights Symposium so that they can learn from their peers around the world. Yes. Again, congratulations. That is absolutely huge. And I look forward to hearing about your visit in the fall because I'm sure you guys will, will make it there. Um, we have about five minutes left, but I would like to hear a little bit more about your experience at Navdanya um, and visiting with Dr. Vandana Shiva. Um, and then if anybody else has any questions or comments that they would like to make to Sherry, um, kind of gather your thoughts because there will be an opportunity to do that um, at the end. Yeah, um, so we, we, the treaty was about 12, 10 to 12 days, if I'm remembering correctly, if memory serves me. Um, and then we, um, we only had about four additional days. So we were able to fly up to Dehradun and then um, spend three days at Navdanya, um, which many of you probably know is Vandana Shiva's famous, incredible biodiversity farm in Northern India. Um, and so that was really our R&R. &R. It was our downtime, um, which was a wonderful place to do that after being stuck in the hotel and in meetings all day. It was wonderful to re-engage with the land and be back in nature. Um, 
And actually it was quite an exciting time at Navdanya. They were getting ready to launch their first in-person course since COVID. Um, and so there were a number of um, students arriving from around the world to attend their A to Z of agroecology course that was happening the week after we were there. Um, we did not know if we were going to get to meet Dr. Vandana Shiva. Bill knows her personally and has hosted her in the U.S. before, um, so he was in touch with her. But as it turned out, we did get to meet her, which was just really tremendous and phenomenal. So we sat with her um, twice, actually. So she sat with us as well as some of the other students that were there and just shared her wisdom, her knowledge. Um, I will say that um, it was wonderful to see her in her space, to see her at Navdanya. There was a softness about her in that space. Um, and I think her, her, her firmness is needed and is important, but it was quite lovely to see her in her beautiful farm that she's built. Um, you can tell that that really is her home. And she actually said, you know, I, I've enjoyed not having to travel so much these last few years due to the pandemic. She's really been able to root in, in Navdanya, which is wonderful. Um, a really exciting outcome from that is very early on in our conversation with her, she looked at Karen and I and said, you know, the Philippines and India really should work more together. And I like almost started crying because I remember actually when we founded our first seed library in Tublai Binget, we gave all of our partner farmers um, her seed freedom pledge um, and all of them have it hanging on their farms. Um, and I remember saying, oh, like maybe someday Navdanya or Dr. Shiva will know about our work. And so um, it really felt like a, a big milestone for us to get to be at Navdanya, to get to see her space, to get to interface with her um, and to start to envision how we could collaborate because they're actually doing very similar programming that we are. Um, our last morning there, um, there was a group of about 30 women farmers that were attending an organic farming training. And so we sat with them in the morning and got to got to hear their opening songs and opening ceremony before their training started. And a big part of their model that they're now doing is seed teacher training. So they're not only facilitating trainings, but they're helping prepare their Indian farmers to teach their Indian peers. And that's a huge part of our model as well. So lots of synergies. We're really hopeful we'll be able to go back to Navdanya, bring our staff, bring some of our farmers and have an, a rich exchange and learn as well as teach um, in that space. But it was really wonderful to walk in and see that world famous seed library. Um, you know, I think I think the pandemic has impacted everyone, but it was it was quite wonderful to be there and, and see um, that they're still thriving, they're still going and, and the timing of it was great. There was a lot of energy on the land because they were getting prepared for their first in-person course since COVID. And again, you know, Dr. Shiva's energy just brings brings a palpable spirit. Um, so uh, a personal as well as professional dream fulfilled that I got to spend a little bit of time with Dr. Shiva. My goodness, that sounds just wonderful. Thank you for sharing your experience about that. Um, does anybody have anything that they'd like to ask Sherry? Any closing thoughts? Feel free just to unmute at this time. All right, well, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up. Sherry, thank you. Thank you for this hour spending with you. It was just lovely. I really enjoyed just learning more about all the details that Global Seed Savers is doing in the world. Um, and thank you and your whole team for all of the incredible work that you're doing. Um, everybody on the call and everybody that might be listening and watching this video later, um, please consider following Global Seed Savers. Um, consider making a donation if you have the financial capacity to do so. Um, and thank you for joining us for this month's Seed Story. I hope you all have a beautiful, blessed evening. Thank you, Francis, and Seeds in Common. Thanks for all your work. Thanks for being here and listening. Thanks, everybody.